Welcome. I welcome you all to this lecture in the course Samasa in Paninian Grammar 1. In this course, we have so far studied the overall contents and we got introduced to the overall nature of the theory of compounding that the Paninian grammar has advocated. We in the previous lecture took example of how the compounding process moves, what it takes as an input and what it generates as an output. We said that sentence and words within that sentence which are interlinked are the input for this process and a pratipadika is the output generated by this particular process and then such a pratipadika becomes the input for the other sentence formation. We also use the word realm of Karaka theory to describe how the Pratipadika becomes an input in the next level sentence. So now in this lecture we shall proceed further but before we actually begin let us recite the Mangala Shloka. Vishvesham Satchidanandam Vandeham Yokhilan Jagat Chari Karti Bari Bharti Sanjari Harti Leelaya Vishvesham Satchidanandam Vandeham Yokhilan Jagat Chari Karti Bari Bharti Sanjari Harti Leelaya Now let us sum up the features of the process of compound derivation or generation as well as the theory of compound formation that we have seen so far. The features can be put down in terms of the input as well as the output and here we are introducing some new technical terms. So let us study them one by one. What is the input of samasa? Input of samasa is a sentence. So the process of compounding takes sup. It here refers to the process of compounding. It takes sups and interrelatedness of sups as input. And the output is generated by this particular process in the following terms. So samasa is a nominal root. Output in the form of a samasa is a nominal root, in other words a pratipadika. And to this pratipadika is added a pratyaya called sup, which can also become the input for another process of samasa if so desired by the speaker and we have seen example of this particular recursive process. So the essential point over here is that the suffixes known as sups they are part of inputs and also they are output of the and they and the output of this process also becomes an input for another sub to be added to it. 
This is a very important feature of Samasa which we must comprehend in totality. We must also note down what is not done as far as the theory of compounding in Sanskrit is concerned. Also the process of derivation of a compound in Sanskrit is concerned. What is not done? So even though in the sentence just as in Purusha Su and Rajan Ngas, Ngas and Su acting as the head they were interrelated and so Rajan and Purusha being the interrelated Padas and Padarthas they were merged together and Raja Purusha was another Pratipadika that was derived. This is a Samasa and a Pratipadika is derived. So also are Su in Purusha plus Su and T in Gama plus T are interrelated. But they are never, never in Sanskrit merged together as one meaning unit as well as one word unit. This is never done. So in Sanskrit you will never find a compound of Purusha plus Su and Gama plus T even though they are interrelated. The compound is primarily shown or seen happening between soups and never between soup and thing. This is the bottom line. What is not done is in Sanskrit never a su and ti is merged together. So never one unit is derived as output from Purusha plus su and Gama plus ti. They both remain independent and separate parts of the sentence being interlinked. Now su and ti are representatives of a set of suffixes known as sup and thing respectively and we shall study what all are these sup suffixes and what all are these thing suffixes. What is important to note here is also the fact that along with the never occurring phenomenon of sup and thing getting merged together and generating the samasa as an output along with that we must also note that the process of compounding or samasa depends entirely on the desire of the speaker and so far it is always performed within one sentence. It is never performed in between two sentences. This is not seen so far. What we can also say is that the process of generation of samasa is always intersentential within one sentence and never intrasentential, never between two sentences. This is never done in Sanskrit. In a nutshell, we can say that Samasa always happens between two soups minimally, which means that there are these two padas at the end of which should appear soup in both. So this left hand side of the plus sign, this is the slot for a prakriti and this left hand side is the slot for another prakriti. Sup is a pratyaya also mentioned as T in the previous lecture. So this is the slot for the root, this is the termination. In this case it is sup which is the termination 
and in Sanskrit there is a possibility of only two types of terminations either sup or thing. Now the process of samasa, process of compounding presupposes or takes input as two subantas and none of them should be a tinganta. So never sup plus thing, never a case where one pada is a subanta and the other pada is a tinganta or both padas are tingantas. This is never seen. So the theory of compounding in Sanskrit does not explain or does not allow these types of compounds. They are never generated and so they are not generated. One of the reasons why this happens is because the speakers of Sanskrit have never done such compounds. They always have generated compounds of this kind where there are two subantas and then they get merged together. So this is a list of soups. These are the 21 soups divided into three columns and seven rows. Each column represents number ekavachana, one. One represents ekavachana, two here represents dvivachana and three here represents bahuvachana. Singular number, dual number, and also plural number. This is the significance of the numbers in white. And now if we go to the numbers in black, we see that there are seven such numbers, seven rows, each representing what is known as a vibhakti. Prathama, one, vitiya, two, trutiya, three, chaturthi, four, panchami, five, Shashti 6th and Saptami 7th. So we have 7 Vibhaktis and 3 numbers. And here are the Sups. Sa, Au, Jas in Paninian terms. Sa, Au, As. Am, Au, As. A, Bhyam, Bhis. A, Bhyam, Bhyas. As bhyam bhyas, as os am, and e os su. These are the 21 sup suffixes. So, a verbal element at the end of which appear any of these 21 suffixes becomes eligible to be the input for the process of compounding. Now, when these sup suffixes are added to the nominal root that is a pratipadika we get subanta forms of this kind these are the 21 subanta forms which can also be the input of samasa and they are also stated in the same fashion as was used to state the sub suffixes so let me read these 21 forms for you Ramaha, Ramau, Ramaha, Prathama, Ramam, Ramau, Raman, Dvitiya, Ramena, Ramabhyam, Ramaihi, Trutiya, Ramaya, Ramabhyam, Ramebhya, Chaturthi, Ramat, Ramabhyam, Ramebhya, Panchami, Ramasya, Ramayoho, Ramanam, Shashti, Rame, Ramayoho, Rameshu Saptami. These words, all of them, any one of them, is eligible to be an input for a samasa. In contrast, here are the 18 things which can never become an input of the process of compounding in Sanskrit. And they are 
ती तस झी सी थस थ मी वस मस त आताम झ थास आथाम ध्वम ई वही एंड मही एंड दीज एटीन सफिक्सेस आर डिवाइडेड इंटू टू ग्रुप्स एंड ईच ग्रुप इज फर्दर डिवाइडेड इंटू थ्री रोज एंड थ्री कॉलम्स द नंबर्स इन वाइट दे रिप्रेजेंट द नंबर एंड द रोज रिप्रेजेंट द पर्सन सो थर्ड पर्सन सिंगुलर इज ती ड्यूएल इज तस एंड प्लूरल इज झी and so on now both these sets are numbered in a peculiar manner because essentially both these sets have three persons and three numbers however their status as a meaning conveying unit undergoes change and therefore they are listed as 3p and 3pi 2p and 2pi 1p and 1pi the numbers remain same now these are added after the root which is a verbal root which is a dhatu and then the tinganta forms are derived and these forms can never be the input of a samasa and these forms are nayati nayatah nayanti nayasi nayatah nayatha nayami nayavah nayamaha and then nayate nayete nayante nayase nayethe nayadhve naye nayavahe nayamahe none of these is eligible to become an input of the process of compounding this is very very clear and we have to be also very clear about this after having seen these basic features of the theory of compounding in sanskrit let us now proceed to understand the meaning of the word samasa which is quite regularly used samasa what is the meaning of samasa first of all let us see what are the components of the word samasa there are three components the first one is the first one is sam plus asa and asa also has got two components the verbal root asa and the suffix a the verbal root asa means to throw and the suffix a means an action the preverb sum means together or collective there are brackets given with purpose so as and a they form the first unit at the same time sum is also associated with as and that is why they are put in one square bracket so now the meanings are together plus throw plus action now when this throw and action they join we get the meaning the action of throwing the act of throwing and then this together further modifies the action of throwing and then when we put all these three meanings together we get one meaning namely the act of throwing together this is what is samasa the act of throwing together now what is being thrown here the answer is the act of throwing together the sounds the sounds are being thrown out thrown out from where the act of throwing together the sounds from the oral cavity which means that the sounds take shape or the sounds are generated from the oral cavity and are pushed out and they generate the audible speech 
However, sounds are produced in gaps. So different sounds are produced separately. Different sound units are produced separately. That is not what is samasa. When such independent sound units are uttered together from the oral cavity, then that act is called samasa. So when a, a person utters the sentence radnyaha purusho gachati, here there are three sound units which are thrown out of the oral cavity independently, separately. Now when the first two words radnyaha and purushaha, they are merged and they are thrown out of the oral cavity together in the form of Raja Purusha without being a sign of separation. They are thrown out together, Raja Purusha. This throwing out of the sound units from the oral cavity in the form of an audible speech is what is the meaning of Samasa. As opposed to this, when the sounds are thrown out independently and in separation, they are known as Vyasa or Vyasta. In Vyasa, we have V plus Asa plus A, which indicates the separation of the sounds being thrown out of the oral cavity. This is, in a nutshell, the meaning of the word samasa, which is very much appropriate to describe the process of compounding in Sanskrit. The word samasa is also used in other literature, in, even in philosophy, where the word samasa is used to indicate the collective explanation the gist, the explanation that is merged together. For instance, in the celebrated text of Srimad Bhagavad Gita, we find an instance where the verse says, Tat Samasena Shrunu. So please listen to what I am saying by Samasa. That means I am collecting and merging certain elements together and making it brief and full of meaning. Pray, listen to it. Even there, this meaning of the word samasa explained on this slide is distinctly visible, which is remarkable. So, the meaning of samasa is the action of throwing the sounds together out of oral cavity. The action of throwing the sounds together to convey one meaning unit. And so the sounds thrown out together thus act as one unit, which convey one meaning unit. So Raja Purusha is one sound unit and it conveys one meaning unit as opposed to radnyaha, purusho and gachati, where radnyaha is a separate sound unit, purushaha is the separate sound unit and they convey different separated meaning units. And in comparison, if you say raja purusha, now that separation has disappeared and they have merged the two units have been merged into one, both meaning as well as the word. So, the word samasa presupposes the separation of the words as part of the sentence. So, this correlation is extremely important and therefore, compositionality plays a very crucial role as far as the meaning of samasa is concerned and also the form, the word form 
of the samasa is concerned. What this assumes is that samasa always presupposes a sentence. We have already seen this. We are putting it in different framework. Samasa always presupposes a sentence. There is no other way development, which means that from Samasa, a sentence is developed. This is not possible. You do not have Samasa as the primary stage as far as the language is concerned, as far as the communication is concerned, and then from the Samasa is generated a sentence. This other way development is not possible as far as Sanskrit language is concerned. As far as Sanskrit language is concerned, first there is a sentence and then there is a Samasa. But without a sentence, Samasa cannot exist. The Samasa always falls back upon the sentence and always refers to the elements within a sentence. As we shall see later on, when we look at the differences between the sentence and the samasa, there are some ambiguities that creep in the formation of the samasa. They are to be removed only by looking at the sentence that it represents in the given context. However, we also note that when such a sentence is not readily available, then such a samasa may lead to multiple possible explanation in terms of various sentences. It is equally important to note here that never so far have we found in Sanskrit the fact that a sentence consists of only samasa. This is not possible. Never. It must have, besides a samasa, at least some tinganta or some such word, at least for the theoretical purpose. What it also assumes is that no linguistic communication, as far as Sanskrit is concerned, consists of only samasa. This is not possible. Sentence is the basic unit for communication purpose and this sentence might contain some samasa. But it can never happen, at least for Sanskrit, that there is a sentence and it consists of all samasas. This is not possible. This is very important to remember. So what is the purpose of making a samasa? The purpose seems to be brevity, which is the brevity in terms of cognition, the cognitive brevity, jnana laghava, and then also shabda laghava. We cannot say the same thing about prakriya or prakriya laghava, but at least jnana laghava and shabda laghava seem to be the two basic purposes that a human being achieves or wants to achieve by making a samasa. What is also to be noted here is that the purpose of making a samasa is to make two independently, separately cognized elements the subject of one cognition. Eka buddhi vishayata. Two elements which were earlier identified as independent and separate two elements, now we identify them as one element. Eka buddhi vishayata seems to be one of the purposes, major purposes, why samasa is made by a human being while speaking. Now this Eka Buddhi Vishayata process may occur recursively. This is possible. 
in literature etc but in normal communication this ekabuddhi vishayata operates with certain limits the other purpose of making a samasa is sangraha this is putting ekabuddhi vishayata in the other words sangraha which is a collective cognition we'll talk more about this later on to summarize we studied the process of compounding and noted that the sentence is the input for this process with the interrelatedness of meaning in a sentence as a basic condition and then we also noted that the nominal root is the output of this particular process we noted that never ever does this process happen between a sup and thing and also thing and thing we also noted that the process of compounding is recursive in nature next we study the process of speech production and the cognitive stage the sentence structure of which samasa is one part then the input of the samasa the nature of interrelatedness of meanings in a sentence the concept of karaka the concept of vibhakti and finally the difference of samasa and a sentence along with this then we shall see how the theory of samartha combines these theories and generates a compound we shall see this in the coming lectures these are the texts that we shall constantly refer to thank you for your attention